Hello, everybody. Uh, it's so good to, to be here. I would like to welcome you on behalf of Humanity and myself. Thank you, John Christophe, for your words. My talk will be about you know, business uh, and, and DevOps. How does it work together? I want to I want to shine a little light on, on, on that topic because uh, Greg gave me a call and he said, you know, we want to do this, this remote event. We really want to do it big. We want to have, so can you connect us to other people of, uh, of the Edge of Manifesto? It's going to be technical. And of course, the first thing I thought about was James because James and I worked uh, a, a little bit over a year ago together at the Humanity office in the Netherlands, which is really great. Um, and then in the end, and I think James played a, a part in there, John uh, and um, uh, Uncle Bob came in. Now, I, I asked Greg, I said, okay, what do you want me to talk about in, in terms of, this is a technical session, right? And I, I left the world of development uh, quite a few years ago, so I don't perceive myself anymore as someone who can speak on technical issues. There are people who are better at this, and they are here today with us, right? And he said, yeah, yeah, but can you... Can you please talk about the, you know, the, the thing that we have with the connection with the business? Because you know, this in the DevOps world, we still struggle with how to connect to the business. And I thought, this is so funny because if I look at it, uh, last week ago on the Monday, I was talking to uh, an organization that is uh, uh, working uh, globally. We had a session, a full day session, and I did the same talk in the morning and in the, in the late in the afternoon because there were all those time zones to cover. And when I talked with them, they said, you know, we're in this agile transformation process now for two years, but we have a problem connected to the business. And I said, okay, so it's sort of a universal problem. Wherever you go, it's the thing. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk with you and I would like to start with, okay, so almost 20 years ago, like, like uh, JC just said, uh, we wrote the manifesto, but coming to this, at least for me, started in, in 1994. And I would like to take you there briefly. And, and, and I do this because for me, if you talk about, you know, the business and how to connect to the business, this is what it's for me all about, right? Um, so I, I would like to take you back, I don't know how many years, uh, over, uh, let, let's say 26 years, more or less, right? And um, I, was, I was doing... A project for a large governmental organization in the Netherlands, um, as traditional waterfall as it could be. And what, what came to my mind was that after we started in November 1993, I remember that we, we stopped, we were stopped in uh, May 1994. So after seven months of hard work with 30 people full time, and it was just stopped. So, and I mean, stopped, killed, pros, everybody out because we were all externals. And to my knowledge, it has never been restarted again. And I thought, how in the world is it possible that we are able to work on something that can be stopped and not be restarted? Because obviously there was no need for the business when we started, otherwise we wouldn't have been stopped. There could have been changes, but we would not have been stopped. And for me, that was like an ethical issue, right? You, if, you, if you do something um, in general for any kind of organization, delivering value for this client, for this business, even if you work there yourself, delivering value is what you should do because it's your time, it's your money that's putting, being put in there. And I think it's, 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 you should be deeply ashamed if you're not able to deliver some value to this, right? Because that's what, what they expect from you. Otherwise, it's just waste. And if you, you know, the, the extra level on this is if you spend public money and it's wasted like this. I make the calculation and it was millions already, right? Millions. I think if you would calculate it down to euros, it would have been a waste of 10 million euros, something like this. And it's, I mean, if you spend public money, it should be on one thing and one thing only, you know, bringing the best. This is public money. It should be, it should be benefits, beneficial for the public, any kind. You put it in education, elderly care, health care. I don't know what you do, but you know, make sure that it pays back, right? And obviously nobody in that situation, nobody felt just this bit responsible for wasting public money. And, and, and the same organization is hitting the newspapers all over again. And even last week, uh, there was, you know, it's still a chaos there. And the, the, the millions, 10 millions and more fly around on, you know, on, in the headlines still, right? So there's so much work still to do. So okay. I would really like to focus on the Should um, Okay, so value is for me the thing. Also, um, we, could, we go a little bit to the next one. 
Um, and that's when we started doing this in the mid 90s, I made my change in 1994. I started doing rapid application development, that kind of thing. Uh, we said, oh, you know, if you do something, you know, your, your first delivery, like an MVP or anything, you know, six months is absolutely the max. We know now that six months, and JC was already referring at it, um, six months is, is not what you can do. You, you, the, the big problem is, uh, you know, and let's say until, until late last year, uh, very early this year, I would have talked with you about things like, uh, oh, you know, uh, technology and innovation goes at such a pace, whatever you do, whatever you're making, you know, you have to be aware that, you know, it, the technology not only changes things, you know, the way we work and the way we do, but it disrupts entire business models of, of organizations and, and you have to be prepared as an organization to do this, right? And we know the stories how disruptive, for example, the introduction of WhatsApp was to the market and it destroyed almost quite a few uh, telecommunication providers, right? So this is a big thing. Um, so I say, always say, and I said, you know, for so many years, Agile is about avoiding delay. So you wanna make sure that you deliver the best business value possible that the organization needs um, with the best internal quality. So without bugs and errors in efficient with the efficiency uh, to the best way you can. If you don't deliver the right value, you need to do a lot of rework and that's a delay. If you have a lot of bugs, you need to do a lot of rework. That's a delay. If you work inefficient, it's a delay anyway. You need to avoid those, right? And if you look at the manifesto, coming back to the topic of, of uh, you know, connecting to the business, delivering the business value, uh, the, the first principle we talk about, you know, satisfying the customer, that's, that's, that's what we aim for. And I think today, if you want to deliver value, uh, speed has become more important than ever. I was talking to someone uh, uh, recently, and I don't like to capitalize on something that has such an impact as the COVID-19 crisis, but I, I will use this example. Um, this is a company, uh, a gentleman was talking about, this is a company, they have a turnover of more than 10 billion a year. And from one week to the other, they lost over 90, over 90% of their revenue. It means that they almost lose $1 billion every month. You don't have six months, you don't have three months to respond. Right, you have to do something, and that means you have to know what you know what what the value is that that your organization needs. You have to be flexible and adaptable to to change it if things happen in the environment, and your delivery has to be you know spot on and the first time right. So the question is, how do you do this? I will not talk about the technology part. I will leave that part to the other three speakers if they want to. Um, but uh, if if I look at you know at Delivering the value, it's talking about the customer. And if you if you want to deliver for something, something that that is for your for your customer really valuable, you need to know your customer. You need to talk to your customer. And the first thing that I want to give to you is you never will be able to rule out misunderstandings if you do the via via communication. And in the waterfall, it was via via because we, someone would make a document and send it over to someone else, would make another document out of it, and, and someone else would make another document out of it. And you would stack misunderstanding on misunderstanding. The business would not even be in there, right? So it's about connecting to your business. And it's not the via via, but it's direct communication. Uh, we say it in the manifesto, you know, face to face communication is the best way to con convey information. Another thing in the manifesto says, business and development people should working together on a daily basis, right? And that's for me so fundamental. You know, I, I started maybe, maybe sort of in a, with a lucky shot, but when I made my change in 1994, and it was the first thing that we did was a, a project at the time uh, with the, Royal, the Dutch Royal Navy. And from the first moment on, we were talking to the, the business was with us. And we had a couple of times you know, direct connection, talking to the business. We were in one room making drawings on flips to make sure that you rule out all the misunderstandings and that you can check if it brings the value or not because you're looking for value. You're not looking to produce a list of requirements. The business, the organization wants to achieve a value. So working on a daily basis is the fundament, you know, together, all people together, is the fundament of what we do. Uh, in my opinion, if you want to work agile. And for me, 
technology is a precondition to be able to do this, right? If you look at, at you know, the, one of the differences between traditional and, and agile way of working is that we work in those short time frames, working sprints or time boxes every two, three weeks to deliver. And if you're on the software side, right, and if you want to deliver every two weeks, you cannot do without technology, right? But on the other side, if you want to deliver value to the business, you cannot do without the business, right? So you need to bring those two together. And um, what, what I always, I think it's amazing if you look at it, what I see is so, so we have, we have the business people here and we have, we have development people here and our solution, you know, to, to the new way of working is that we put the PO in the middle. And, and the only thing that happens is that, you know, you get this kind of thing. So we, we, we sustain the via via communication and that's what you don't want. I remember, I remember in the early nineties when I was, I was, I changed jobs and uh, we have a probation time, two months at a time in the Netherlands. I was through my probationary time and my field manager came to me and I was doing development in the world of the mainframe, Kix, COBOL, DL1, DB2, job control language, you know, that kind of thing. And then he said after two months, okay, Ari, now, now we need you to, to, to select a specialism for yourself. And I thought, interesting. I do 40 hours a week, and that's, that's the legal time frame. You work 40 hours a week, especially in those days in the Netherlands. I do Kix, COBOL, DL1, DB2, job control language, right? That's what I do. And, and I think that's a specialism. And he said, no, 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 no. What I mean is you need to be a specialist in in insurance or in government or in banking or in logistics. And I thought, how in the world, if I spend 40 hours a week on Kix, Cobalt, DL1, DB2, and job control language, how can I be the specialist in somebody else's job? And this is where synergy comes from. This is where multidiscipline teams come from, right? You need to be together in a shared responsibility. One defines what kind of value that the organization is needing. People who know who know how to get there, you know, from the organization will be working together, who know how to make it. And together they take the responsibility, right? That's that's where we want to go. That is the kind of collaboration that you that you look for. Now, what we see very often is that that kind of working together where business and, and development work together is very limited. And the limitation is very often to Okay, you know, before we go into a sprint, we have a refinement on some requirements. And at the end of the sprint, you know, we'll, we'll meet each other again. Now check yourself out, right? If you see something for the first time, and it's, you know, either you accept or reject it, you will always find something. Because when you talk together, you know, before going into the sprint, in that conversation, there will be always, whatever you do, assumptions and interpretations. And then at the end of the sprint, two or three weeks, whatever you do, you will bump into those you know, misunderstandings that are created by, by the interpretations and assumptions. So you, and you want to avoid delay because at the end of the sprint, if you go there and people say, no, I don't, I don't reject, I, I don't accept, I, I reject this. You have a problem, you have a delay. And that's the one thing that you don't want. I think it was uh, like two and a half years ago, uh, early 2018, I'm not entirely sure that I saw, um, an, uh, an article on LinkedIn posted by Mike Cohn, who was one of the authors of the manifesto and one of the authors representing Scrum when we wrote the manifesto. And I cannot give you the exact details of the, of the article anymore, but it was like, don't make the demo into an acceptance meeting. You have to build acceptance during your sprint. And of course, that's, that's, that's how it is. Because if you do an acceptance, any kind of acceptance, the major problem that we have with acceptance meeting is that people don't accept whoever they are, right? So you have to find a way to get there. And the, the first thing that you have to realize is you, you cannot work like this. You cannot have someone in between development and the business. Those are the people that you know, need to be collaborating. And instead of doing it like this, you should do it like this and making sure that the PO is bringing the people at the table so people can check and verify and validate on the spot if this is what you are. And you don't, you don't do it just once in a sprint, you know, once before and maybe once at the end. No, you have to build this one. Uh, the, the word that I always use for it is the heartbeat. And I call it an all stakeholder session. Um, and what you, what you get out of it is, you know, if you refine before going into a sprint and you have everybody together, your people from the business who are going to use the solution, right? After delivery. 
and who know what kind of value that the organization is looking for, what they need. And if you start your sprint and after two, three days, you get together for like half an hour, 45 minutes, and you show quickly what has been made. It's like a little demo, if you like, and you show what has been made. For sure, you're going to get feedback. For sure, there will be a little bit of misunderstandings, assumptions, interpretations. If not, there is a situation where people might say, hey, I, you know, this is what I said at the refiner. If we do it like this, it would be a little bit better, right? So that kind of refinement on the spot, you know, to converge to the best value for the organization is what you need. It's what you need for the value side, but it's also for the emotional side, you know, to build your acceptance, to build your ownership. And the point is, if you do it like this, it's not someone making something for someone. It's a group of people making something for the organization, right? The collaborative approach, the shared ownership. That's what you look for. That's the thing that you, that you want to create, what you want to build. You, you want to make sure that you have a group of people that feels responsible at the end of that sprint or after five, six sprints, you'd say this MVP, that's the one that we made and we're proud of it, right? And we know that's going to bring the, the, the value to the organization. That's where you want to go. And then all of a sudden, you, you don't have an acceptance at the end of your sprint. Of course not. No, you build it because you do it every two, three days. So you have, you know, at least four times in a sprint, you have this kind of session. So everybody has been in the situation to make sure that they can you know, give the feedback, that they can check, they can validate. Did you understand me well? So the misunderstandings and the interpretations are taken out and they can verify, does it bring the value? Or maybe, maybe we even have a slightly better, you know, more valuable solution if we do this. Now, this is very helpful. And I did it like this. And I am very proud to say, because I said, you know, the very first time that I did this, we started working like this. And I kept on doing this. And um, in the terms of delivery and acceptance, I've been without an exception always been successful unless I failed to get the business people in because business people, I'll come back to this later, uh, might have an excuse not to be there, right? So it's, it's a success factor. That's what I know. Now, the point is, right, if you, if you look at all stakeholders and said, okay, you know, in those hard beats, you have those people together. Who are stakeholders? What are they doing? And of course, we have in the process, the business people, they need the value, they need the solution. So they will give feedback and refine on, on, the, on the, you know, the solution itself and how it's working and the functionality it offers. But we also know that there might be other entities in the organization that have a say and can allow or block you in going live. For example, I did a lot of governmental work, the legal department is in. And if you accept, I have been in a situation where I made apps and websites for, for the government. Everything that is sent out to the public has to be checked and approved by someone from the legal department. So if I don't take them in that process of sprints, what I will create is, okay, I'm done in my sprint. And now I'm handing over to the people from the legal department and they will either accept or reject. And I create the same old problem that I ever had. So I know that everybody who has a say in, can I go live or not, has to be part of it. This is why I say all stakeholders. So I have my legal department. I remember we're doing work for telecommunication providers in the Netherlands. You could not go live with any kind of web oriented solution if you were not checked out by marketing communication because it was about colors, it was about fonts, it was about the text. So whatever you did, right, it was not about, never about the functionality, but it was about, okay, do we allow you to go live? So for me, all stakeholders is coming back to, I need to identify what's going on exactly. I need to identify how this you know, product you know, is uh, approved in the organization and every uh, department or entity or whatever you call it, that in the organization that has a say in, in the work that I do with the teams, in a saying go live or not, that's for me a stakeholder. That should be in the process that we have together. So this is where you go from all business people and, you know, and, and development working together on a daily basis. This is the addition where I have been able to, to save deliveries, be on time and stay within budget and get the value and the return on investment ASAP. And I think this is what we work for, right? Because I can do 
fast whatever I like, but if one, you know, a chain is as strong as the weakest shackle, right? So the point is, if I have a development process and it involves people in the organization, departments, entities that can either accept or reject what I make, I need to make, bring them into my process and I need to make them co-responsible. Instead of having a role where you test what the team has made, what you do is that you, you say, okay, you know, you're, you're from the legal department. You're going to be part of this team. Here we have the developers, here we have the business. You know, we're going to make this. This is the value that we're looking for. Your role in this team is during every heartbeat that we have to check out what has been made. If there is any kind of problem in going live, if so, we want to know it in the heartbeat right away because then we have time before the end of the sprint to fix it and we can go live at the end of the sprint without a delay. And that has become my mantra, right? Avoiding delay, avoiding delay. And then you get the COVID-19 situation and it's, it's John Christophe was referring to it. Change can goes these days so much faster than it, than it we, we ever could expect. Um, until until early this year, I would say, you know, the pace of innovation has gone up, will never go down again. So the time window for deliveries and, and to be adaptive to, to all kinds of changing situations um, is very important uh, to have as an organization. Uh, and today it's even you know, more clear that it has to be. I like to say that Agile working, and for me, DevOps is part of the Agile family. Agile working is about avoiding delay. Agile working, therefore, is a I do apologize. Is agile working is a corporate capability to to uh, to avoid delay. I, I I like to to go back to you know, adapted to change to avoid delay, avoid delay over and over again. Um, so every two three days is going to help you in saving a lot of time. It's the efficiency. Uh, because instead of sending out something to someone waiting until they review it, sending information back, now I have them at the table. And that's really interesting. That heartbeat is working, right? The big problem is um, that we uh, have a situation um, that it's different from before. And I, I so often I get into organizations say, hey, we're in agile transformation, we do it for two years, we do it for three years, for four years, we are very agile, right? Okay. And then I find out that they do in, in, their, in their work in a sprint, they work in the agile concept, they apply Scrum, TDD, uh, they pair and they refactor, that's great. But after delivery in the sprint, it goes for test and then it goes for user acceptance test and it goes for... And I have people that, you know, with dry eyes, without crying, would say, yeah, yeah, we work agile, we have a sprint for development, and then we have a sprint for test, and then we have a sprint for this, and, we have a... and that's what we want. We, we want to avoid delay, right? And that's the point. So in terms of working together, it's a solution. What amazed me when I was doing this uh, in, um, in the, the late 90s, right? I was, I was at an, one organization I remember, doing three projects in a row. This is 1998, 1999. They were struggling every single project they did, delivering on time with a happy client and within budget. All those three, always a problem. So we start doing this and it was not perfect, but we had a very happy client. We were on time and within budget, right? So it was there. So you do your first delivery and then you do your second delivery and then you do your third delivery, everybody happy. And you think, hey, this is awesome, right? Absolutely awesome. So now, now the organization knows that this has worked. So now we can all work like this from now on. And then we say, no, 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 no. We stop working like you do because it's so complicated. And I thought at the time, you know, how come it's complicated? The only thing that I do is I put people at the table having face-to-face -face communication instead of remote and written communication. So how come, how come that people something that's obviously so simple to do, how come that they say this is complicated? And it took me a while, a couple of years to be honest, honest that the change is not in the, the way you work in Agile, you know, having retros and demos and dailies and, and working with your technology. It's the layer below and it's, it's the paradigm 
that's really the problem. And I want to, you know, if you look at in the Dutch dictionary, so maybe in your language, I know I don't know where you're all from, uh, but a paradigm is a perception, a perception of life, of how life is. It's like a given truth in your life. And uh, for example, you know, silos in an organization, for example, decision making processes and toll gates, for example, uh, progress reports, for example, you know, having this very tiny specific role, not have being in contact with the business, not knowing what the value is all about. Like my last governmental project where I was a technical designer, never met the business. And I, I pushed my, my technical design forward via mail to a developer I never met. Right, so you, you think, okay, you, things are changing. And that's the biggest problem. People don't like change. And I think most of you will know that most people are not fond of change, but how come if you have a problem, and then you have the solution right here in your hands. How come it is possible that you, that you don't, are not able to accept this? And that's the paradigm layer be, below it. So if you go into agile working, uh, you have to understand that you have to make a paradigm shift. Now in the late 90s and the beginning of the century, for me that meant that I spent a whole lot of time before going into my development sprints with the client on how to work. You know, I set the collaboration agreements, how, this, how are we going to do this, about the heartbeats and about you know, all kinds of sessions that we have and the visual management that we have in, instead of you know, making word progress reports. Um, and then you, know, you, you agree on it. You do it, you're successful, and then people fall back into the old way of working. I've, I've been in a number of companies where you do, we would say, an agile transformation these days. We were doing really well, and you come in two years later, and they use all the agile words, and they do all the wonderful things. How come? The big problem is with a, um, with a, with a paradigm, it defines your reflex under stress. And also, it's, it's about, um, it takes time to change. Now, I don't know where you're from, but I'm from the Netherlands. The, you know, the, the steering wheel in a car is on the left side, right? And if I go to the UK and I rent the car, all of a sudden, for me, it feels as if, okay, you know, the, the wheel is on the, diff, the wrong side of the car, on the right side of the car. And it's odd, you know, distances and measure. And even if I take a roundabout or go left or right, I have to pay so conscious, I have to pay attention to what am I doing? Paradigms are reflexes, our, our, our habits are automated things. And changing paradigms is the most difficult one you do. And you have to be also strict. I remember last year, uh, my client in a big transformation said to me, I don't compromise. And I want to give you an example in a metaphor. Let's say that you and your team have been playing soccer. Right? You've been playing soccer for, for years and you're really good at playing soccer as a team, right? People, 11 people in the field. And now all of a sudden the decision is that something happens in the world. We are going to play hockey because it's more efficient, more valuable. And if you say it quickly, uh, greenfield, white lines, two goals, white ball, they're the same. So if I take people from a soccer field into a hockey field and I don't give them proper guidance, I have a problem because people don't know what to do. So what they will do is they start playing football on a hockey field with a hockey ball, hockey goals, and things go wrong because there will be a hockey referee expecting hockey stuff and things go wrong, right? So things are uh, not easy to get there. And I think we are, we are as human beings lazy because we accept, oh, this is difficult. Oh, this is complicated. We accept that so easily. And then we stay where we are. I would like to give you a quote that I saw on the wall of a client of me in Central Europe. You know, one of those meeting spaces big on the wall. And supposedly it's uh, from Winston Churchill or from Cardinal Newman. Someone uh, uh, pointed this out to me. It could also be Cardinal Newman. I think both of them are sort of under debate at the moment. But the quote is like this. Being perfect is not a state. Being perfect is an ambition. To reach your ambition, you need to change a lot. So perfect people change a lot. If you replace, search replace, perfect by agile. Being agile is not a state. Being agile is an ambition. To become agile, you need to change a lot. So agile people change a lot. And I think this is where we are lazy. We try to, 
go into the into the you know into the comfort zone and to stay there and and to say okay you know in the past it was described we work like this and now it's described we work like this you know we, we take another manual out and there we go and that's not how it works so first of all you need to experiment and you need to understand that you know every organization has its own bureaucracy and, and silos and ways of working that need to be changed. So there is no transformation process the same. And also going through the change per organization, it will, it will be different because the point is uh, resistance on an individual level can be different. The resistance on the corporate level can be different. The support from the leadership team can be different. There's so, technology has an impact. So we, can, we, we cannot just take it for granted. And I was, I think uh, two and a half years ago, I was talking to someone who had the official title of Director of Agile Transformations. And it was late January, and this person said to me, we are going to be Agile as an organization, April 1, two months from now. This was 2,500 people. And I think, I like the ambition, right? But if, give, give me the magic wand that, that helps us doing that, because then I would be called Ari Potter instead of, you know, Ari van Bennekum. So you have to understand that changing the paradigms is difficult. You have to understand that changing uh, paradigms takes time because the old paradigm will be, will be lingering for a long time. And when things go wrong, and if you play hockey for the first time, things go wrong. And then we say, oh, it doesn't work. And we try to find the solution and the solutions from the past. So before you know it, and I call it innovating backwards. After a year, you know, we try to play hockey, but we're just playing football on a hockey field. And we, we say we play hockey, and as someone who understands hockey, you know what the benefits of hockey are, and look at you see, what the hell are you doing, man? What does it look like? So for me, in this, in this business agility, uh, you have some specific things that you need to overcome, paradigms that you need to overcome. You, as I said, right, as I wrote down on the flip chart that I just tore off, but you need to talk directly to the business. Those business people in the current situation have another job. They are, you know, policy makers. They are, you know, salespeople. They are whatever they are. You know, they have a job. And all of a sudden you say to them, oh, you want us to make that solution for you. Now we need you on our side. Because, you know, and they will say, no, no, no. You, you know what I want. And I will say, no, no, I don't. I don't know what you want. It's even worse. I don't know what you need. And now it's, now it's really getting worse because you don't know really what you need. Those details, remember no detail design up front is possible, are coming from being together, you know, checking it out and getting the feedback and refining so you can converge to the best possible value that you can get in this time. Overcoming this kind of thing, and then if you go to the corporate level, you're embedding things like innovation. In Look at what happened here in the COVID-19 crisis, the client that I was just talking about. You know, they were losing a billion a month, right? If you lose a billion a month, you want to be sure that within one or two months, you need to be up and running with new, and you, you know you will have new solutions, and you also know that some of those solutions will not work, but also you know that some of those solutions will work, and, and maybe will give you, you know, at least part of what you had before back, and maybe even more, you, you never know, right? So you need to go in this continuous exploration of what's going on in the world, and, and you have to be prepared as an organization to, to, to go into massive innovation and drastic fast change because the outside world is that asking that from you. And a lot of people and a lot of uh, um, organizations don't, I think, give it the proper value, you know, having that corporate capability. We stick to do a couple of sprints in the IT department and that's it. But if you, if you have a very fast IT department and the legal or the marketing department is working slow, the delivery to the market is slow. Remember that we want to avoid delays so you don't get there, right? So that's a big thing. Um, if you come back to working agile, what should it ask from us, right? What is it, what is it that, that we can do to make that happen? I think patience is one. And patience, what I mean, okay, so most things will not be perfect the first time. It takes improvement. It takes, you know, being there and doing this. And also it means that, you know, um, you have to be open to learning. And I see everywhere, and also in the agile world, I'm sorry to say, I see a lot of people that cannot listen to someone to understand. We listen to someone to reject what they say, to say that they are wrong. They will interrupt you and say you're wrong. And I know I do that sometimes as well. 
because you have your point to say. But if, if you have a problem and someone says, hey, I know how you can solve this problem. Listen, and don't say, because I've been, you know, for the 26 years, people would say, and still, it happens every month, at least still sometimes. Oh, that's an awesome idea, but it doesn't work for us. And then I would ask, oh, did you try? No, 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 but it doesn't work for us. And I think that's the big, the big agile heart in us, if you're a real agilist, is that you understand one, you don't know everything. You can always learn, always. Don't stop the learning. And if someone says, hey, I have a lesson learned here, please take your time and, and spend on, on, on listening to those people. And if you go bring it back into a development you know, team, and I like to call that a solution development team where all people are represented, so the business people and all the other stakeholders and the developers. If you make something and the business people say, oh, uh, I'm sorry, you know, that's, that's not exactly what I meant or it's not exactly what I need. You know, if you do this, it's working better for me. Don't feel offended. Don't feel treated badly. But please do understand that this is the process of refinement. This is, instead of having a detailed design up front, going to a process where you accept that you don't know up front in detail and you go together and in a couple of iterations, we call it an iterative approach, right? So where's the iteration? Do you really iterate? Because just doing deliveries and sprints is not the iteration. An iteration is doing the same thing a couple of times to improve it. So if people show you, and you get the feedback then you can take the feedback in. Now, the big problem that people very often say is, oh, you know, people from the business, they never know what they want because they change their mind all the time. Yeah, that's correct. You know, in that detail, you can say that's correct. And that's why you are here because this is the only way you can get to the most valuable delivery that you can get for this business. We don't know upfront in detail what it will look like. Experimenting is part of it and also creating new insights is really helpful, right? You can get even more benefits, if you like, coming out of it. It will change your organization. It will change your collaboration. It will change the way you document. It will change the way you report. It will change the way you deliver. So yeah, we're in a world of change. Um, two weeks ago, I was confronted during an, uh, an interview uh, with re academic research saying, okay, I already know, so many people talk about Agile, but if you look at agile transformations across the globe, most agile transformations are not successful. And then you touch on exactly this problem because the collaboration between, between the development organization and, the, and the, the, the business people, this is the first one. And then we have the other stakeholders as well, right? But this is, this, and this is, a, this is not a temporary change just for now. This is the permanent change that we need to go through. This is changing the world, the organization that you work in today to something new. And also like, like building a new solution where you don't know at the beginning in detail what the solution will look like. How that collaboration with the business and the other stakeholders will look like in the beginning of your transformation process. You don't know. And don't think in this situation, you know, we're working as over two years or for three years. You know, we don't have to do, we don't have to do this transformation anymore. I'm sorry, yes, you do. Because you can always do Agile 1.0 and Agile 2.0 and Agile 3.0. There's always more that you can do to improve. And people don't like change. Uh, last year, uh, just after some time, I was talking to people and they were in their, in their mind, they were doing Agile um, working. And they said, uh, we don't do retrospectives anymore because we don't have any problems. We're, we're, we're doing fine. And they were every single sprint failing. So they would do a refinement and every single sprint, they were not living up to their commitment. Can you see the mindset and the attitude? It can be a protective situation because in this organization, if you say you have to learn a lot, maybe, but maybe you're in danger, right? So transparency, safety are very important preconditions to work in this. I said transparency is the carrier of agile. Now the couple of one liners that you can give. So transparency is, is for me the carrier of agile. Agile is about getting information at the source. So you have business and development people working together. But making things transparent can be dangerous. And getting information at the source makes people responsible. But yeah, but you said, right? And people say, oh, I don't want this kind of responsibility because that's very dangerous. Because in this organization, it means that if I do this, 
you know, I might be, it might be backfiring. Um, I got, I get questions even, even this week, how to do performance measurement on teams. For me, that's a very risky one because before you know it, you know, performance measurement is something like I can see this is a good team and that's a bad team. So it becomes, you know, into rewarding and punishments and that kind of thing. If you do measurement to see, okay, how can, as a team, how can we improve? That's the good thing for me to do. Uh, so there are a lot of things are, are there connected to edge of working that are difficult to overcome. And I just ask you, check yourself, right? How is it working for you? Are you getting your information at the source? Is it working? And how is your leadership behaving? Or are they just still you know, pushing extra requirements into, into your team while you're in a sprint, you commit to stuff, and all of a sudden they barge in and they, they put pressure on the people in the team, sometimes even to individuals in the team, drag them out of the, of the process that you're in in your sprint. But check it out, and where can you improve? And that kind of improvement. And, and I, maybe I'm a purist because, uh, you know, that, that, that manifesto is so, sort of, you know, of course it feels like a little baby. Um, but I, if you just keep on improving and you do this within the values and the principles of the manifesto, and once you check them all in the box, so tch, 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 then it's great, right? But I think if you look deep inside, there's still a lot that you can do. And if you do something, understand that this is going to help your business. This is delivering the value. This is, this is about, okay, now, now, I'm, now I'm being able to help the organization more. And that's what, sorry, but that's what you paid for, right? And if I see what some agile professionals and coaches and scrum masters and product owners, what they make, I would always say, you know, you need to feel on your shoulders the responsibility to deliver value to your client, whether it's an internal or an external client, I don't care. And then, then, it's, the, then it's the business. That's what it's all about. Right? You do agile for the business value and you want to deliver the, the value without any delay because that is what your organization needs. Um, people will say, it's so difficult. Yeah, and I want to I want to give you, you know to change organization. In our own little team, we can do this, but you know, to connect it to other teams, and and then we have the management teams, but you have this department, and it's not it's not easy. But you have to keep on going. Um, the paradigm shift is always working. It's getting you back into old habits. If people are talking to you about doing something in, in, in the Agile DevOps way that you didn't do yourself before, that was not successful when you tried to, and you think, yes, but, you know, it, if you think this, know that this is an old paradigm tapping on your shoulder. And also know if you want to get the Agile benefits, you know, you have to, you have to keep people together. You have, to, you have to make sure that the people are together. And I like to say that if you work Agile, that, the, the success in Agile comes with the quality and the discipline that you apply using the Agile rituals. And when I say the discipline is you do them. And I heard the phrase, and maybe you heard them yourself, I hope you didn't say them, but I heard the phrase, you know we do the daily once a week because it costs so much time. If you don't understand why you're doing it daily, you don't have the point about working Agile, right? The daily is so relevant in working Agile. If you don't understand this one, Go and ask for it, because the only thing you do if you do you postpone your daily to once a week, the time window for identifying impediments goes from one working day to five working days, and you have less time to fix it. So you have a risk of you know, delay at the end of your sprint. This kind of simple thinking needs to be there. So on one hand, it's the simple thinking. On the other side, it's the old paradigm that keeps on telling you, yeah, but. Know that if in this kind of working you identify something, um, you cannot change someone else. That's impossible. You can use force to make people doing different things. But the moment the force is gone, people will fall back into old habits. Now, the good news is people can change themselves, only themselves. So if you are in your retrospective doing and working, and if you think, okay, you know, we had something going on in this print, and it was not an incident, but we see it repetitive coming back. We need to solve this one. Take the lead and take it on you and make sure that you lead this improvement. Because if you tell to someone else, you know, this is what went wrong and you're more or less you know, pushing it to someone else, they will push it back and you don't as a team get to the resolution together.
And this is in working as developers together, but it's also working in the business together, right? You will have your, your business people when you're on a specific problem, on a specific product, on a specific service, service that you design and develop and, and bring out there. You, know, you have to be, keep people together. And you have to understand we work this, we have this shared responsibility. So if you can do this little improvement yourself, in the end, it will be beneficial for the business, even if you are not a business person. It will be beneficial for the business. And maybe that's where I want to get to the closure. But this is for me what it's all about. It's all about every time getting a little bit more value to the organization. That's why you're there. And that's why you paid. And that's why I think you hope you, you spend your time there. The only way to deliver the business value is connect to the business. Get your information out the so at the source without any kind of misunderstandings, without any kind of inefficiency. Get the people at the table. Accept that you iterate in a sprint a couple of times. So this session that takes half an hour, 45 minutes has to be there. And it says fast feedback pays off. It goes so fast, right? And it helps you so much in bringing in the delay. And that's what I want to give to you. So look at yourself, see how you talk to the business. I see already Greg coming up being ready, being ready to, to take over from me. Very good, yeah, very good, Greg. Yeah, I know, four minutes. I'm close to, to, to finishing. But I really wanna give this to you. So, um, so far my, my talk, um, the only thing I can say, if you wanna connect to me on uh, things like LinkedIn or Twitter or Instagram, feel free. Uh, if you ask me a question, for example, in, in the LinkedIn chat, most of the time within half a day, you'll have an answer. Greg can, by the way, can confirm I work like this. We met years ago in South Africa for the first time, and this is how we got our relationship together. 